The Prologue to the Epistle to the Romans by Martin Luther Translated by Thomas F. Lockyer This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This epistle is the very climax of the New Testament and the pure essence of the gospel, being quite worthy and deserving that a Christian man should not only know it word for word by heart, but be occupied therewith daily, as with daily bread of the soul. For it never can be too much and too well read or pondered, and the more we have to do with it, the more precious it becomes and well relished. Therefore, I will also add my service, and through this prologue prepare an introduction thereto, in so far as God has enabled me, in order that it may be the better understood by every one. For hitherto it has been badly obscured with comments, and all sorts of chatter, being nevertheless in itself a clear light almost enough to enlighten the whole scripture. Section 1 In the first place, we must be acquainted with the language and know what St. Paul meant by these words, law, sin, grace, faith, righteousness, flesh, spirit, and the like else we cannot profitably read therein. Law The little word law thou must not here understand after the manner of men, as that it is an instruction what sort of works are to be done or to be left undone, as is the case with human laws, for one keeps that law well enough with works, although the heart is not in it. God judges according to the heart's innermost motive. Therefore his law also requires the heart's motive, and does not allow it to be content with works, but rather condemns works done without the heart's motive, as hypocrisy and lies. For that reason all men are called liars. Psalm 116 verse 11, because no one keeps God's law from the heart's motive, nor can keep it, for everyone finds in himself dislike of the good and delight in the bad. Now where there is not free delight in the good, there the heart's motive is not in the law of God. There indeed is even sin and the incurring of God's wrath although outwardly many good works appear and reputable behaviour. Therefore, St. Paul concludes, chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, that the Jews are all sinners, and says that only the doers of the law are righteous before God. He holds nevertheless that no one by mere works is a doer of the law, but says rather to them, in verse 22, Thou teachest that one should not commit adultery, and thou committest adultery. Again, verse 1, Wherein thou judgest another, therein thou condemnest thyself, for thou dost the very same thing that thou judgest. As if he should say, Thou livest with fine outward show in the works of the law, and judgest those who do not live so, and knowest how to teach every one. Thou seest the splinter in the other's eye, but of the beam in thine own eye thou art not aware. Matthew 7 verse 3. 4. Though thou indeed outwardly keepest the law with works, for fear of punishment or love of praise, 
yet so thou doest all without free delight and love for the law, but with dislike and constraint, thou wouldst rather do otherwise, if it were not for the law. For it follows thence, that from the bottom of the heart thou art hostile to the law. For of what good is it that thou teachest another not to steal, if thou in heart thyself art a thief, and wouldst willingly be one outwardly, if thou durst, though even the outward work does not long remain with such hypocrites. Thus thou teachest another, but not thyself. Thou knowest not even thyself what thou teachest, hast even never yet rightly understood the law. Indeed, for that reason the law increases sin, as he says in the fifth chapter, verse 20, that man becomes only more hostile to it, the more it demands that of which he can do nothing. Therefore, he says in the seventh chapter, verse 14, the law is spiritual. What is that? If the law were bodily, then it would be served sufficiently with works. Now, however, that it is spiritual, no one does enough for it, for all that thou doest must proceed from the innermost heart. But such a heart no one can give, save the Spirit of God, who makes man equal to the law, so that he gains delight in the law from the heart, and henceforth does all, not from fear, nor of constraint, but out of a free heart. Thus the law is spiritual, that will be loved and fulfilled with such a spiritual heart, and that requires such a spirit where he is not in the heart. There remains sin, dislike, hostility to the law, which nevertheless is good, righteous, and holy. So now accustom thyself to the statement that doing the work of the law is a very different thing from fulfilling the law. The work of the law is all that man does or can do in the law of his free will and his own strength. Since, however, underneath and close to such works there remains in the heart dislike and constraint with regard to the law, such works are all spoiled and of no use. This is St. Paul's meaning in 3.20, where he says, Through the work of the law is no man righteous before God. Therefore thou now seest that the school wranglers and sophists are misleaders, if they teach him with works to prepare himself for grace. How can he, with works, prepare himself for grace, who can do no good work without dislike and unwillingness in his heart? How shall God desire the work that proceeds from a disliking and repugnant heart? But to fulfil the law is to do its works with delight and love, and freely without the law's constraint, to live godly and well, as if there were no law or punishment. Such delight, however, of free love, is the gift of the Holy Spirit in the heart, as he says in verse 5. The Spirit, however, is not given except in, with, and through faith in Jesus Christ as he says in the preamble. Now faith does not come, save only through God's word or gospel, which preaches Christ, how he is both God's Son and man, who died and rose again for our sakes, 
as he says in the third, fourth, and tenth chapters. Chapter 3, verse 25, chapter 4, verse 25, and chapter 10, verse 9. Thus it comes to pass that only faith makes righteous and fulfills the law, for it brings the Spirit through the merit of Christ. The Spirit, however, creates a cheerful and free heart, as the law requires. So then good works proceed from faith itself. That is his meaning in 331, after he had repudiated the works of the law, so that it sounded as if he would abolish the law through faith. No, says he, we establish the law through faith, that is, we fulfil it through faith. Sin Sin means in Scripture not only the outward work in the body, but all the activity that is astir with it, and issues in the outward work namely, the motive of the heart with all its force. Note also that the little word do should mean when man altogether plunges and is carried away into sin. For no mere outward work of sin is in question if man is quite carried away into it with body and soul. And scripture especially looks into the heart and on the root and main source of all sin, which is unbelief in the innermost heart. Note also that, as faith alone makes righteous and brings the spirit and joyful compliance to good outward works, so unbelief alone commits sin and brings in the flesh and pleasurable compliance to bad outward works, as befell Adam and Eve in paradise. Genesis chapter 3 verse 6 Therefore Christ calls only unbelief sin, as he says in John 16 verses 8 and 9, The Spirit will convict the world of sin, because they believe not on me. For that reason also, before good or bad works come to pass, as good or bad fruits, there must first of all be faith in the heart, or unbelief, as the root, sap, and chief force of all sin, which in scripture also for that reason is called the serpent's head and the head of the old dragon that christ the woman's seed must crush as was promised to adam genesis chapter 3 verse 15 grace grace and gift are of this difference that grace properly means God's favour or good will, which he vouchsafes us for his own sake, on account of which he is graciously disposed to give us Christ and to shed abroad the Spirit with his gifts in us, as is clear from 5.15, where he says, Grace and gift in Christ, etc. Now, if these gifts and the Spirit daily grow in us, and yet are not fully accomplished, so that evil desires and sins still survive in us, which war against the Spirit, as he says in chapter 7, verse 14 and 15, 23, and Galatians 5:17 and as in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 is announced the conflict between the woman's seed and the seed of the serpent, yet does grace avail so much that we are accounted altogether and fully righteous before God. For his grace does not divide and separate itself 
as his gifts do, but receives us altogether and entirely into his favour, for the sake of Christ, our advocate and mediator, and because in us his gifts are begun. Thus, then, thou understandest the seventh chapter, where St. Paul still blames himself as a sinner, and yet in the eighth, verse one, he says there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ because of the as yet uncompleted gifts and because of the Spirit. On account of the unslain flesh, we are still sinners. But because we believe on Christ and have the earnest of the Spirit, God is to us so benevolent and gracious that he will not consider nor judge such sin, but will bear with us according to our faith in Christ till sin is destroyed. Faith. Faith is not human opinion and dream, which some mistake for faith. And when they see that no improvement of life nor good works follow, and yet they are able to hear and talk much about faith, they fall into error and say, Faith is not enough, one must do works if one is to be religious and saved. This causes them, when they hear the gospel, to fall from it, and fashion for themselves by their own power a notion in the heart that says, I believe. This then they mistake for a true faith. But as it is a human fiction and notion that the inmost heart never experiences, just so it does nothing, and no improvement follows after. Faith, however, is a godly work in us, that changes us and causes us to be born again of God. John chapter 1 verse 13 and slays the old Adam, makes us quite different men in heart, mind, motive, and all our faculties, and brings with it the Holy Spirit. Oh, there is something so lively, creative, operative, mighty about faith, that it is impossible that it should not without ceasing work that which is good. It does not ask, indeed, whether good works are to be done, but before one can ask, it has done them, and is always doing them. But he who does not such works is a faithless man, fumbles and looks about him for faith and good works, and knows not what either faith or good works are, yet babbles and prattles much of faith and good works. Faith is a living, deliberate reliance on God's grace, so sure that it would die for it a thousand times. And such reliance and knowledge of God's grace makes us gladsome, courageous and cheerful towards God and all creatures which thing the Holy Spirit accomplishes in our faith. Therefore man becomes joyfully willing, without constraint, to do good to everyone, to serve everyone, to bear all kinds of suffering for God's love and praise, who has shown him such favour, so that it is impossible to separate works from faith, just as impossible as that heat and light should be separated from fire. Therefore, beware of thy own false thoughts and unprofitable imaginations, which would fain be skilful to judge of faith and good works, and are the greatest mockery. Pray God that he work faith in thee else thou remainest indeed for ever without faith, contrive and do what thou wilt or canst. Righteousness Righteousness is henceforth such 
faith, and is called God's righteousness, or the gift of God. For the reason that God gives it, and reckons it for righteousness, for Christ's sake, our mediator, and so creates man's new nature, that he renders to all men their due. For through faith, man becomes free from sin, and gains delight in God's commandments. Therewith he gives God his glory, and pays him his due, but he willingly renders service to men, to the best of his ability, and therewith also pays his due to every one. Such righteousness can neither nature, free will, nor our own strength bring to pass. For, as no one can give faith to himself, so can no one take away his own unbelief. How then will he take away only one least sin? Therefore everything is false. It is hypocrisy and sin that is done apart from faith or in unbelief romans fourteen twenty three let it make as brave a show as it may flesh and spirit by flesh and spirit must thou here also not understand that flesh is only what concerns unchastity and spirit what concerns the inmost heart but St. Paul calls flesh, as does Christ in John 3, verse 6, what is born according to the flesh, the whole man, his body and soul, his understanding and all his mind, for the reason that it all lives and moves in him according to the flesh. Mind also that thou knowest how to call him fleshly, who without grace speculates much proffers instruction, and talks glibly of high spiritual things, as thou mayest indeed learn from the works of the flesh of Galatians 5 verse 20, where the apostle calls even heresy and hate fleshly works. And in Romans 8 verse 3 he says that through the flesh the law is made weak, which is said, not of unchastity, but of all sins, chiefly, however, of unbelief, which is the chief of all vices of spirit. Mind again, that thou callest him spiritual, who is occupied with the most outward kind of works, as Christ when he washed the disciples' feet, and Peter, when he managed the boat and fished. Also, that flesh signifies a man who lives and works, both inwardly and outwardly, the sort of life and work that serves the interests of fleshly advantage and of the present life while spirit signifies one who lives and works, inwardly and outwardly, in a way that serves the interests of the spirit and of the future life. Without such understanding of these words, thou wilt never understand this epistle of St. Paul, nor any book of Holy Scripture. Therefore, take heed of all teachers who use these words differently, be they who they will, though they were even Jerome, Augustine, Ambrose, Origen, and the like, or even those of higher rank. Now we will take up the study of the epistle. Section 2 Chapter 1 Inasmuch as it beseems an evangelical preacher, at first, through manifestation of the law and of sin, to reprove and represent as sinful all that is not actuated by the Spirit, 
and by faith in Christ, whereby men are led to self-conviction and sorrow, so that they become humble and desire help. Thus also does St. Paul, and begins in the first chapter by reproving gross sins and unbelief that are open in the light of day, as were and still are the sins of the heathen who live without the grace of God, and says, There is revealed through the gospel God's wrath from heaven upon all men on account of their godless behaviour and unrighteousness. For though they alike know and acknowledge daily that there is a God, Yet nature in itself is so evil, apart from grace, that it neither renders him thanks, nor honours him, but beguiles itself, and falls without ceasing into worse behaviour, until it works in its idolatries even the most disgraceful sins, with all vices, unashamed, being, for the rest, given up thereto unpunished. Chapter 2. In the second chapter, he extends such accusation even more widely to those who outwardly seem religious, but are secretly sinful, as the Jews were, and all hypocrites still are, who, without inclination and love, live well and respectably, and in heart are at enmity with God's law, though they are ready enough to judge other people, as is the manner of all dissemblers, so that they think themselves pure, and are yet full of avarice, hatred, pride, and all filthiness. Matthew 23, verse 25. They are just these who despise God's goodness, and after their hardness heap to themselves wrath, so that St. Paul, as a true interpreter of the law, lets no one be without sin, but proclaims the wrath of God to all, who would live well by nature or free will, and accounts them no better than open sinners. Yea, he says, they are stubborn, and impenitent. Chapter 3 In the third, he throws them both together into one mass, and says of the one as of the others, they are all alike sinners before God, except that the Jews have God's word. For although many have not believed therein, Yet thereby God's faithfulness and truth is not at an end. And he adduces, incidentally, the saying in Psalm 51, verse 4, that God is justified in his words. Afterwards he returns to it, and proves also through Scripture that they are all sinners, and no one is justified through the work of the law but the law is given only for the knowledge of sin. Thereafter, he begins to teach the true way, how one is to become religious and saved, and says, they are all sinners, and fail of the glory which they should have in God, but must be justified without merit, through faith in Christ, who has won such merit for us through his blood, and become for us a mercy seat before God, who forgives us all former sins, whereby he demonstrates that his righteousness, which he gives by faith, alone avails us, which at this present time is manifested through the gospel and formerly was testified through the law and the prophets. Moreover, the law is established through faith, although the works of the law are thereby brought to naught, together with its glory. 
Chapter 4 In the fourth, since now throughout the first three chapters sin has been made manifest, and the way of faith unto righteousness is taught, he begins to take up certain objections and claims, and examines this first, which all those commonly urge, who hear of faith, how it makes righteous without works, and say, Ought one then to do no good works? Thus for himself he brings forward the case of Abraham, and says, What then has Abraham done by his works? Has it all been in vain? Were his works of no use? And he concludes that Abraham, apart from all works, has been justified through faith only, so entirely that even before the work of his circumcision he is commended in Scripture as having been justified on account only of his faith. Genesis 15 verse 6 Since, however, the work of circumcision accomplished nothing for his justification, which yet God commanded him, and which was a good work of obedience, so certainly will no other good work accomplish anything for justification, but as the circumcision of Abraham was an outward sign, wherewith he evidenced his justification by faith, so are all good works only outward signs which follow from faith, and are the evidence, like good fruits, that man is already inwardly righteous before God. Thereby, St. Paul now confirms, as with a powerful example from Scripture, his former teaching in the third chapter, verse 27, concerning faith, and brings forward yet another witness, namely David, from the thirty-second psalm, who also says that man is justified without works, although he does not remain without works when he is justified. Afterwards, he extends the example in opposition to all other works of the law, and concludes that the Jews cannot be Abraham's heirs on account of blood alone much less on account of the work of the law, but must inherit Abraham's faith, if they would be his true heirs, since Abraham, before the law, both of Moses and of circumcision, was made righteous through faith, and is called a father of all that believe. Moreover, the law works much rather wrath than favour, because no one does it with inclination and love, so that much rather comes disfavour than favour through the work of the law. Therefore must faith alone obtain the favour promised to Abraham, for such examples also are recorded on our behalf, that we too should believe. Chapter 5 in the fifth, he comes to the fruits and works of faith as being peace, joy, love to God and every one, besides assurance, courage, cheerfulness, spirit, and hope in tribulation and afflictions. For every such thing follows where there is true faith because of the superabundant goodness which God shows us in Christ, in that he has suffered him to die for us, before we could ask him for it, yea, while we were yet enemies. Thus, then, we find that faith makes righteous, apart from all works. And yet it does not follow from this, that one should therefore do no good works, but that goodly works cannot be restrained of which hypocrites know nothing, and feign to themselves works of their own, wherein is neither peace, joy, assurance, love, hope, courage, nor any kind of true Christian work and faith. Then he makes a spirited outburst and expatiation, 
and tells where both sin and unrighteousness, death and life, originate, and accounts the two as hostile, the one to the other, namely Adam and Christ. He goes on to say, Therefore must Christ come, a second Adam, who bequeaths to us his righteousness, through a new spiritual birth by faith, just as that former Adam has bequeathed sin to us through the old fleshly birth. Thereby, however, it is known and proved that no one can deliver himself from sin unto righteousness with works, as little as he can help being born bodily. It is also thereby shown that the divine law, which yet should properly avail, as it should help us somewhat towards righteousness, has come to be not only without avail, but has even increased sin. For this reason, that our evil nature becomes the more hostile to it, and will the rather indulge its lust the more the law restrains it, so that the law makes Christ yet more necessary, and asks for more grace that may come to the help of nature. Chapter 6 In the sixth, he takes the particular work of faith by itself, the conflict of the spirit with the flesh, for the entire destruction of the rest of the sins and lusts which remained over after justification, and teaches us that we are not so freed from sin through faith that we should be idle, lazy, secure, as though no sin were any longer there. There is sin there, but it is not reckoned for condemnation on account of faith, which is in conflict with it. Therefore, we have enough to do with ourselves as long as life lasts, that we may tame our body, slay its lusts, and subdue its members, that they may be obedient to the spirit and not to the lusts, in order that we may be conformed to the death and resurrection of Christ, and fulfill the meaning of our baptism, which signifies the death of sin and the new life of grace, till we are quite pure from sin, so as to rise again also bodily with Christ and live for ever. And this we can do, he says, because we are in grace and not in the law, which he himself explains as that to be without law is not, as is often said, that one has no law, and may do every one what he likes, but to be under the law, is when we occupy ourselves with works of the law apart from grace. Then certainly sin lords it over us through law, since no one is kindly disposed to the law by nature, but that is great sin. Grace, however, makes the law lovely to us. So then, there is no sin there any more, and the law is no more against us, but is at one with us. That, however, is the true freedom from sin and from law, of which he continues writing to the end of this chapter, namely that it is a freedom only for doing good with delight and living well without constraint of the law. Therefore, such freedom is a spiritual freedom, which does not flout the law, but provides what is required by the law, namely, delight and love, wherewith the law is satisfied and has nothing more to urge and to require. It is just as if thou wast in debt to a liege lord and couldst not pay, from him thou mightest get free in two ways. On the one hand, that he should exact nothing from thee, 
and cancel his bond. On the other, that a benevolent man should settle the matter for thee, and give thee wherewith thou mightest satisfy his bond. In this way has Christ made us free of the law. Therefore, it is not a wild, fleshly freedom that shall do nothing but one that does much and manifold and is free of the law's demand and debt. Chapter 7 in the seventh, he confirms all this with a comparison of the matrimonial life, to wit, when a man dies, then is the woman unmarried, and is thus released and parted from the other one. Not thus that the woman may not, or should not, take another man, but rather that she is now, first of all, quite free to take another, which she could not do formally, till she was parted from that man. So is our conscience bound to the law under the old sinful man. When this is slain through the spirit, then is conscience free and released from the other one. Not that conscience should not act, but it is now, first of all, in a right condition to attach itself to Christ, the new man, and bring forth the fruit of life. Then he opens out more widely the nature of sin and of the law, how through the law sin is now all astir and becomes violent for the old man becomes only the more hostile to the law, because he cannot pay what is required by the law, for his very nature is sin, and can of itself be nothing else. Therefore the law is its death and its thorough torment. Not that the law is evil, but that our evil nature cannot bear the good as requiring good from it just as a sick man cannot bear that one should require him to run and jump and do other works of a healthy man. Therefore, St. Paul here concludes, that where the law is truly recognized and understood at its best, there it can do nothing more, for it reminds us of our sin and slays us through the same and makes us liable to eternal wrath, as it shows itself altogether hostile, and asks of the conscience if it has quite fallen in with the law. Also, that one must have something other and more than the law, to make man religious and saved. Those, however, who do not truly recognize the law, are blind, they proceed therein with presumption, they think to do enough for it with works, for they know not how much the law requires, namely a free-willing, joyous heart. Therefore they do not see Moses just before their eyes, the veil is spread before them and hides him from view. Then he shows how spirit and flesh are at conflict with each other in a man, and sets himself before them as an example, that we may learn truly to recognize the work, how to slay sin in ourselves. He calls both, however, the spirit and the flesh, a law, for this reason, that, just as it is the nature of the divine law that it urges and insists, so does the flesh also urge and insist and rage against the spirit and will have its way. On the other hand, the spirit urges and insists against the flesh and will have its way. This contention goes on in us as long as we live, in one more, in another less, according as the spirit or the flesh is stronger. And yet the whole man himself is wholly both, spirit and flesh, who is at conflict with himself, till he becomes quite spiritual. 
Chapter 8 In the eighth he comforts such competence, in that such flesh does not condemn them, and indicates what is the nature of flesh and of spirit, and how the spirit comes from Christ, who has given us his Holy Spirit, who makes us spiritual, and suppresses the flesh, and assures us that we are nevertheless God's children, however fiercely sin may rage in us, so long as we follow the Spirit, and strive against sin to slay it. Since, however, nothing is so good for deadening the flesh as cross and affliction, he comforts us in affliction because of the aid of the spirit of love and of all creatures, to wit, that both the spirit in us sighs and the creature itself with us longs that we may be free from the flesh and from sin. Thus we see that these three chapters, six, seven, and eight, insist on the work of faith only, which there signifies slaying the old Adam, and subduing the flesh. Chapters 9, 10, and 11 In the ninth, tenth, and eleventh chapters, he treats of the eternal purpose of God, whence primarily it comes to pass who shall believe or not believe, who can be free or not free from sin whereby it is quite taken out of our hands and placed entirely in god's hand that we become religious and this is of the very highest necessity for we are so weak and uncertain that if it remained with us there would certainly be not one man saved the devil would surely overpower them all now, however, that God is sure, in that his purpose does not fail him, nor can any one hinder him, we yet have hope against sin. But here is the place for setting a limit to the mischievous and high-flown spirits that bring their understanding hither at the outset, and lift it up on high to peer beforehand into the abyss of divine predestination, and vainly to worry themselves therewith, whether they are predestined. They must then come to this, that they either despair or take a loose chance. Do thou, however, follow this epistle in its order, Concern thyself beforehand with Christ and the gospel, so that thou knowest thy sin and his grace, and then contendest with sin, as here chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 have taught. Then, when thou art come to chapter 8, bowed beneath cross and affliction, that will teach thee rightly the predestination of chapters 9, 10, and 11, how comforting it is. For without affliction, cross, and peril of death, one cannot deal with predestination without harm and secret wrath against God. Therefore must Adam first be well slain before this thing is allowed and the strong wine drunk. Therefore take heed to thyself, that thou drink not wine when thou art still a suckling. Every kind of teaching has its measure, time, and age. Chapter 12 In the twelfth, he explains the right kind of divine service, and represents all Christians as priests, in that they should offer not money, nor animal sacrifice, as in the law, but their own bodies, with the slaying of lust. Then he describes the outward behaviour of the Christian in the spiritual discipline, how they ought to teach, 
preach, govern, serve, give, suffer, love, live and act towards friend, foe, and everyone. Those are the works that a Christian does. For, as it is said, faith does not take rest. Chapter 13 In the thirteenth, he teaches us to honour worldly rule and be obedient to it, which is established for this very thing. If indeed it does not make the people religious before God, yet it does this much, that the religious have outward peace and protection, and the wicked cannot do evil freely without fear or with peace and quiet. It therefore makes for honouring the religious also, although they indeed do not need it. Finally, however, he sums up everything in love, and confirms it by the example of Christ, that, as he has done to us, we also ought to do, and to follow him. Chapter 14 in the fourteenth, he teaches us to deal gently with consciences that are weak in the faith, and to bear with them, that Christian freedom be not used for the hurt, but for the help of the weak. For, where this is not done, there follows discord and contempt of the gospel, wherein, nevertheless, all our interests are involved so that it is better to bear a little with those that are of weak faith, till they become stronger, than that in all things the teaching of the gospel should come to ruin. And such work is a special work of love, which indeed even yet is needed, where, with flesh-feasting and other insolent and rough freedom, altogether gratuitous, the weak consciences are disturbed before they arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Chapter 15 In the fifteenth, he presents Christ as an example, that we also should bear with other weak ones, when they are otherwise sickly, in open sin, or from disgusting customs, whom we must not cast off, but bear with, until they also become better. For so has Christ acted with us, and still acts daily, that he bears with very serious vice and evil customs, besides all manner of imperfection on our part, and helps us unceasingly. Then in conclusion, he prays for them, praises them, and commends them to God, and proclaims his office and ministry, and asks them very gently for their contribution to the poor at Jerusalem. And it is pure love of which he speaks, and wherewith he holds converse. Chapter 16 The last chapter is a chapter of salutation, but therewith he intermixes quite a valuable warning concerning human teachings, which make inroads beside the evangelical teaching, and cause scandal, just as if he had actually seen that from Rome, and through the Romans, should come the seductive, irksome canons and decretals, and the whole verminous ulceration of human commandments and statutes, which now have deluged all the world, and destroyed this epistle, and all holy scripture, along with the spirit and faith, so that nothing more has survived than the idle paunch of the minister. Them here, St. Paul reprimands, God save us from them. Amen. Thus we find in this epistle, most abundantly, 
what a Christian ought to know, namely, what law, gospel, sin, punishment, grace, faith, righteousness, Christ, God, good works, love, hope, cross, are, and how we ought to behave towards everyone, be he religious or sinner, strong or weak, friend or foe, and towards ourselves. Added to this we find the whole excellently grounded in Scripture, evidenced by illustrations of its own and of the prophets, so that here there is nothing more to be desired. Moreover, it also seems as if St. Paul has in this epistle intended once for all to put together in brief the whole Christian and evangelical teaching and to provide an introduction to the whole of the Old Testament. For without doubt, he who has this epistle truly in his heart has the Old Testament's light and strength with him. Let every Christian allow it to be familiar to him and constantly in use. God grant his grace. Amen. End of the Prologue to the Epistle to the Romans by Martin Luther Read by Andrew Coleman